Bob. Welcome back. We're almost through with this course. In this module, we're going to talk not about experimental designs, where we manipulate something and randomize people, but observational designs, where we're not manipulating anything. We're not randomizing people. Observational designs can be thought of as akin to experimental designs. They're just harder to analyze. Most of us will be working with observational designs. It's more practical in the real world but they, of course, have drawbacks. It's tougher to discern or figure out, if you will, X causes Y. And that's why in this slide, I have this little critter here that's actually a Tasmanian devil. The point about observational designs, maybe all of this, but certainly observational designs, is the devil is in the details. And since the real devil actually freaks me out, I'm going to go with the Tasmanian devil. So let's start first with what we call quasi-experimental designs without a control group. So quasi-experimental means we're not actually randomizing. That's the word quasi, sometimes queasy, experiment. But the idea here is we don't randomize, therefore people are deciding if they're going to be treated or not, which means people who are treated are somehow different than those who aren't. People who, who buy blue Ford pickups are different fundamentally in some interesting way from people who buy red Prius cars. They're just different. And when people get to choose that stuff, which we hope they do in real life, this makes the science all the more challenging. So there's several kinds of quasi-experimental designs. In these, this case, there's no control group. Here we just see we have some intervention and then O sub 1, which is observation 1. This is just a one-group post-test only design. So maybe there's some policy change, and we see what people's health is after that. OK, well, you can imagine that this is hard to figure out whether that X, that change, caused the change in the outcome variable, some measure of health measured at observation 1. We don't know what it was before. We don't easily know what, it, what the outcome of health would have been without the intervention. The next set is the pretest, post-test, no control group design. Here we take a pretest, a before, and then there's some intervention, a policy change, or some other kind of thing we work on, and then a post-test, a follow-up. So here we have a pretest, intervention, post-test. We might say, okay, let's subtract the two, the health before, change, health after, make that subtraction, and that we can say, perhaps, the change is due to the intervention. Now, that is a bit of a stretch because we don't know what would have happened without the intervention. Maybe there was already a trend for improving or decreasing health. We can also, quite handily and often advantageously, have more than one pretest. In this very bottom part of the slide, we see that there is an observation one and an observation two, and then an intervention, and then observation three. So here we have two pretests, an intervention and a post-test. This can give us some leverage to say, hey, what was the sort of naturally occurring trend before the intervention? And that might give us some better leverage to figure out what the actual effect of the intervention was on, say, some health outcome. It is usually better to do experimental and quasi-experimental designs with a control group, a comparison group. This helps us with our counterfactual analysis. The key question here is, is the control group exchangeable with the treatment group but for the intervention? So this word exchangeable is a technical term. Can it be flip-flopped? Am I the same with the intervention as without the intervention except for the part of the intervention that changed me? Which is to say, if I didn't have an intervention, Am I the same at pre-test and post-test, except for natural evolution and changes in maturation and all those kinds of things? So what we want to really know when we're talking about comparison groups is are they the same as the treatment group but for the intervention or treatment itself? To the extent they are, we call that exchangeable. To the extent they aren't, they're, of course, not exchangeable. And then we have alternative explanations. 
Some people might call that confounding. That's fine, a technical term. But the real issue is alternative explanations. So yes, Senator, we had some change, but I can't tell you whether it's from the intervention, this community organizing we did, or whether it's from the flood that happened at the same time. The flood confounds my understanding of the impact of my com community intervention. Well, we can diagram these things as we did with experiments. Here in the top part of the slide, we see a post-test only non-randomized quasi-experiment. So here, we have people deciding whether they're treated or not. That's what the NR stands for. And I also put that dotted line in there to make it really crystal clear. And we're doing just post-test only. So here we have an intervention, maybe a policy change that happens in 2015. And we measure people in 2016 in, say, the community that had the policy change and a comparison community that did not have the policy change. Did the policy change change health? Well, that could be assessed by taking the average health difference in the community 01 compared to 02. The assumption there is that these communities were exchangeable. These two community centers, doctor's offices, hospitals, schools, whatever it might be, were the same but for the intervention. To expand on that, to get a little better purchase with our data, we could have a pretest installed as well. So we can do pretest. So we have pre and post, but these groups aren't randomized, and so we probably need some more sophisticated statistical or research analytic skills to try to disentangle this. It's also important to note that we can follow people through time as individuals. So we might say, all right, let's look at some seventh graders at time one, intervene on them to say don't smoke or eat better food, and then measure them in eighth grade. Great. So we're following Billy and Sue and everyone else when they're in seventh grade through into eighth grade and see if their health changes due to, say, some nutritional change or not smoking, whatever other thing we want to help them with. It's also possible, however, to do this by following whole groups. That is, we can follow the seventh graders in 2015, intervene on the whole class, and measure the seventh graders in 2016. So we're always measuring seventh graders. We're not following individual persons or school kids, but in fact, the seventh grade itself. And that's another interesting way to think about these designs. The bottom part of the slide, we can think the same way, but now instead of two pretests, we have two post tests. So, okay, did the X change some things at three months out, maybe six months out, or one year, two years? We can extend how long we think in the future of what these impacts are. So there's all kinds of ways to think about this. The point here is to think about how we're understanding what we're comparing to what in order to discern our real or hypothetical policy changes or anything else you want to do to improve health or mitigate disparities. Let's talk a little bit about measuring policy change observationally. Here's a graph I made up and the vertical axis, when it goes from the bottom to the top, that Y, just some measure of health. Maybe it's well-being measured on a one to 10 scale or something. And the horizontal axis can just be time. It's five years ago to five years later, whatever time scale you wish. And the vertical dotted line in the center of the graph, let's just call that some policy change. That's when maybe there's menu labeling or anti-smoking or everyone has to bike to work, whatever the intervention might be. Here we see two dots. This just might be two averages that we calculate. One sort of orangey, one is sort of pinkish purple. And we see that the difference in those dots is six, and that's what that triangle is. That's a, actually a Greek letter D for delta. And so the change between the, or the difference between the purple and the orange is six units. Okay, and so if we have a policy change at some certain time and see a difference in outcomes between groups of six after that time, the question is, did the policy change cause that difference? A very natural, an important question to ask. In this graph, it looks like, yes, the policy change changed the orange and the purple group to have a difference. But what if this was the case? 
What if both groups were actually rising anyway, despite the intervention? So here we'd say there's no difference because they both went up the same amount. So they started out in different places, both went up a couple of units, and we subtract that out, and there's no difference between them. You might say no net difference. Okay, that's interesting. In this case, the purple group stayed the same, the orange group went up a little bit, and so the orange group went up 1.5 units. The change or the delta is 1.5. We might credibly say, yeah, the policy had an impact of 1.5 health units on the orange group relative to the purple group. That's a pretty good analysis. The important thing to remember is it could be more complicated. Imagine if the real world looks like this, where we had all kinds of variability. The orange group was low, then going up, and then coming down, and the purple group was high, then went down, and that went up. So by having more information, we not only confuse what the true answer is, but we come closer to the truth. And that's the important thing. Because remember, we're really trying to not be ideological. We're trying to find out what works. We're trying to find out what works so that we can do more good. The stuff that doesn't work, we can set aside. The stuff that does work, we can exploit and use stronger. How about with no control group? So here we just have one, maybe this is one community, we're tracking its health through time, and there's some policy change in 2016 or 2020, whatever it is. And the orange is going up, and then, okay, there's a policy change in the middle, then it continues to go up. So is that difference we see before and after that vertical dotted line due to the policy change? I would argue it's difficult to tell. That's the important point here. However, imagine the scenario was like this. We had two communities that through time were very similar. And then we had a policy change. Maybe in the orange group we said no smoking or no abuse of alcohol or something. And the uh, blue group had no such change. Health might improve after that policy change. And we see the blue and the orange groups diverge with respect to health. If we had these data, I think it could be argued pretty well that the policy change had an impact on these groups of people or groups of groups, whatever we want to talk about. So more information can be very useful. The challenge you and I typically have is there's lots going on, but we only measure a couple of data points. And so we can make the wrong conclusion when we say, oh yeah, it looks like the orange increased relative to the blue. But in fact, that may not be the case at all.